Alrighty, we are underway and we're finishing up section 71 which is the application and conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. Last week the sermon came to a close with some comments on prayer and the basic idea, the basic principle that Jesus brought out in Matthew 7, 7 through 11 is constant asking. We're to continually and habitually ask God, turn to Him in prayer. And that was picked up uh, later on by um, the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, a very short phrase that you should be able to, all should be able to memorize, right? Pray without ceasing. Everybody got that memorized? Yes. I mean, if I can memorize it, you can memorize it, right? <laughs> Pray without ceasing. Very good point there. Uh, after that, Jesus summarized true righteousness in verse 12. Therefore, however you want people to treat you, so treat them. For this is the law and the prophets. And we saw that that was a very Jewish statement. Hillel had made a very similar statement earlier. Uh, do not do to your fellow what you hate done to you. This is the whole law, entire. The rest is explanation. Go and learn. So Jesus' comment is very much in line with what Hillel had spoken of earlier. And then a, a centuries later, Maimonides would say it this way. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. All the things that you wish that others should do to you, do you to your brother. So now we're going to pick it up at the bottom of page 5. Jesus now enters into an appeal. And his appeal is organized around four pairs. We'll look at two ways, two trees, two professions, and two builders. So we start with lesson five, page five, at the bottom with the two ways. Everybody there? And in your harmony, we're in Matthew 7, 13, and 14. So uh, in your harmony, it's page 70 in the left-hand column. Verses 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. So the wide way allows for much, but it leads to destruction, and the narrow way allows for few, but it is the proper way. It leads to eternal life. And here's the point. The point on your, um, the bottom of the page there. The Messiah's interpretation of the law, and remember this is the contrast between the Messiah's interpretation of the law in contrast to the Pharisaic interpretation of the law. Yeshua interpreting the law as it is written. And the Pharisees interpreting the law as, uh, through the Mishnah through their traditions. Okay, remember that? So the Messiah's interpretation is much narrower than the Pharisaic interpretation, but it is the correct position to take. And I think a good example of that is the laws of Shabbat, the laws of the Sabbath. You know, basically the Torah says, um, honor the Sabbath and keep the Sabbath. Two commands. But if you look into the Mishnah, you'll see 1,500 additional commands dealing with Sabbath observance. So the, the uh, rabbinic interpretation of the Sabbath is very wide, 1,500 commands, but it leads to destruction. While Yeshua's interpretation, the law as it is written, is very narrow, but it leads to eternal life. If we, if we had followed the law as intended, not setting up our own standard of righteousness, but following the law, it would have led us to the Messiah. Remember, the law is a schoolmaster to take us to faith in Yeshua. Okay? Alrighty, so those are the two ways. The ways of tradition or the ways of the text. Two ways. Two trees. Now we turn to page 6, top of the page. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Continue on down through... Uh, through the uh, left-hand column, verses 15 through 20. 
Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. So the point is that sometimes only the fruit can cause you to see if something is right or wrong. You know, the, fa the false counterfoot looks very, very good, doesn't it? Looks very, very good. Um, you know, when I go to a Costco to get apples, you know, they come in these plastic containers. I, I don't know, a couple, a half, dozen and a half apples in these plastic containers with their own little ball. Well, I pick that thing up and I will look at every apple and I'll flip it over and I'll look at every apple. Why? Because there can be a rotten one in the mess, right? Okay, you have to inspect your fruit closely. Don't take it for granted. Don't just go over there and grab it and take it to the checkout counter. Because what lo it may look good on the top, but you turn it over and it may be rotten, right? And you ladies are a lot better at it than us guys. You know, you feel that produce. You, you know, ah, this is soft. This is rotten. This is no good, right? So this is the idea, this is the picture here, that we need to carefully, carefully examine the fruit. Make sure it's genuine fruit. Because um, another thing comes to mind, you know, the, uh, the oriental restaurants that have the dinners displayed in the, in the case, you know, they look so good, but they're plastic, <laughs> right? Yeah, they look delicious. You could just, you know, take a bite out of them, but they're plastic. Okay, you can be fooled. And that's what we got to look out for. True fruitfulness versus fruitlessness, okay? So he asks his audience to compare two trees and their fruit. You know, one tree is the tree of Pharisaic tradition. And the other is the tree of Yeshua. Look at these two trees. Inspect the fruit. Which one bears genuine good fruit? That's a second appeal. Look for the narrow way. Look for the good fruit. Now, two professions. Middle of page 6. Verses 21 through 23. But not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out many demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. All right, the first thing I want you to notice is what the false prophets were able to do. They, will, they were able to perform miracles. They were able to cast out demons, demon exorcism. And you know, this is recorded in Jewish writings. Uh, for example, in the Talmud, Baba Matsya 59b, starts out a Tanaite statement. So this is a statement by a Tana. Remember the Tana, the, uh, that Paul was a Tana? Remember the school? That was uh, this uh, school of the rabbis that was in force at this time. So this is, comes right out of Yeshua's time frame. A, ten, a Tanaite statement. On that day, Rav Eliezer produced all of the arguments in the world, but they did not accept them from him. So he's, he's argued his position, but the other rabbis don't buy it. So he has to prove it to them. So he said to them, If the law accords with my position, you know, and all the reasons I brought out, this carob tree will prove it, and the carob was uprooted from its place by 100 cubits, and some say 400 cubits. So this carob tree is going to prove that I'm right. Boom! Miracle happens. The carob tree is uprooted, and it's 100 or 400 yards away it comes to earth. Miracle, right? Goes on here. They said to him, There's no proof from a carob tree. We won't accept that. <laughs> So he went on and said to them, If the law accords with my position, let the stream of water prove it. And the stream of water reversed flow. There's another miracle. 
But he said to him, there's no proof from a stream of water, and on and on and on and on. About five or six miracles are stated in uh, Baba Matsya 59b. Okay, so the rabbis were noted for performing miracles. This is recorded in Jewish writings. This is exactly uh, what Jesus says. Okay? The uh, false prophets were able to perform miracles. Now, uh, what about demon exorcism? Josephus records this in Antiquities. Uh, I think it's uh, chapter 8, book 8, chapter 2, paragraph 5, something like that. 825. Josephus says, now Josephus lived around 70 AD, shortly after the time of Jesus. I have seen a certain man of my own country whose name was Eliezer, releasing people that were demonical. The manner of the cure was this. He put a ring that had a foot of one of those sorts mentioned by Solomon to the nostrils of the demoniac, after which he drew out the demon through his nostrils. And when the man fell down immediately, he adjured him to return to him no more, making still mention of Solomon and reciting the incantations which he composed. And that's a King Solomon that he's referring to here. And when Eliezer would persuade and demonstrate to the spectators that he had such a power, he set a little way off a cup or basin full of water and commanded the demon as he went out of the man to overturn it and thereby, thereby to let the spectators know that he had left the man. So we see in rabbinic writings that uh, miracles were, were happening in Jesus' day and uh, can happen today. So what's the point? The point is outward manifestations mean nothing. Outward manifestations mean nothing, you guys. Satan can perform miracles, things like that. What is the true test? The true test is in the text here. First of all, the true test is, number one, a personal relationship with Jesus. He says to them, I never knew you. He doesn't say to them, you know, well, I empowered you to cast out this demon or anything like that. I never knew you. Personal relationship with Jesus. Personal transaction is what he's talking about there. Second, the second test is conformity to Scripture. If we don't conform to Scripture, to the text, then we are practicing lawlessness. If uh, our teaching or our lifestyle or what we're promoting is against the text of Scripture, we are promoting lawlessness. That's his point. All right, so we have uh, two, two ways, two trees, two professions, and now we come to two builders. We're at page six at the bottom, two builders. Uh, verse chapter 7 verses 24 through 27. Actually we're now at the top of page 71 in your harmony and we're still in the left hand column. Everybody get there okay? Alright, therefore, therefore, important concluding word, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came, and the winds blew, and burst against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and burst against that house, and it fell and great was its fall. Now here's the, the application to the sermon, isn't it? A choice lies between, uh, lies in front of every person in the audience, right? A choice lies in front of every person in the audience. Every person has the option of accepting or rejecting his teaching. Now he's just contrasted himself and Phariseeism. So they can either build on him, or they can build on tradition. They can build on Phariseeism. But building on tradition, building on Phariseeism, is to build on a foundation of sand. 
But building on his teaching is to build upon a rock, upon the text of Scripture, which is a firm foundation in adversity. When adversity comes, it can burst against you, but you will stand. Now, the sandy foundation of Pharisaic Judaism was revealed in 70 AD. In 70 AD, the temple fell to the Romans, right? Of course right, yes. Who said that? You get an A. <laughs> and our old friend, Yochanan ben Zakkai, escaped Jerusalem. He went to Yavna on the coast and he started a yeshiva, a rabbinic seminary on Yavna. And there, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai restructured Pharisaic Judaism into modern rabbinic Judaism that we have today. He restructured Judaism away from a religion that needed temple and sacrifice and into the religion that we have today. So, the, so rabbinic Judaism had to be totally restructured. But what about the messianic message found in the New Testament? The messianic message found in the Brit Chadashah is unchanged after 2,000 years. No restructuring necessary. We still go to the same text that the believers went to 2,000 years ago. And this is in spite of 2,000 years of adversity, of constant attacks by unbelievers, isn't it? You know, who was it? Um, who was the fellow that said, uh, that said uh, in 50 years Christianity would be gone? Voltaire, and then Bibles were printed in his very home. Yeah. It's going on today. It's going on today with the uh, aggressive, you know, atheist uh, movement that's going on today. 2,000 years of uh, battering by the storms, and the New Testament has survived. Now, the final showdown between the New Testament, between Brit Chadashah and Rabbinic Judaism, will come during the Tribulation period. The messianic message of Yeshua will survive the adversity of the tribulation period, but Pharisaic Judaism will not. Now why do I say that? I say that because of Zechariah 12.10, for example, because of the messianic prophecies. Zechariah 12.20 is a key one. God says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. So God is going to pour out his Holy Spirit in a unique way upon the Jewish people. So that they will look on me whom they have pierced. God is speaking. How can you pierce God? How is that possible? They will look on me whom they have pierced. And then everything switches again and they will mourn for him. Well, who in the world are they mourning for? As one mourns for an only son, they will weep bitterly over him, like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. How is the uh, conundrum of this verse uh, understood? Well, everything makes sense when we see that Jesus was the God-man, just as the prophecies predicted. The Messiah would be the God-man. He would be God who has been pierced, who will return again, and we will mourn for him. All right? Then... That's exactly what Paul is talking about in Romans 11, 25 through 27. Paul informs us more. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until... A partial hardening on Israel until a certain point in time. What is that point in time? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. When every last Gentile that God uh, plans on saving is saved, all Israel will then be saved. Just as it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. There's your second coming. Okay? At the end of the tribulation period, every living Jewish man, woman, and child will place their faith in Jesus the Messiah and all Israel will be saved. The entire nation, alive at the end of the tribulation, will be saved. And that is a direct repudiation of rabbinic Judaism, which says Jesus is not the Messiah, Jesus is not for the Jew. 
So messianic faith will survive even the trials of the tribulation. All right, so one builder is Pharisaism, exemplified by Yochanan ben Zakkai, built on the sand of tradition. The other builder is Yeshua, building upon the rock of Scripture, on the text. And we have to choose ourselves. Which are we going to build on? Are we going to build on tradition, or are we, we going to build on the text? What does God say about his text? He says in Isaiah 40, verse 8, The grass withers, and the flower fades, but what? The word of our God stands forever. Not the traditions, but the text of Scripture stands forever. Yeshua picks this up in Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Well, here Yeshua has the audacity to make, to make a statement that makes him equal with God, right? Hey, for somebody to say that is either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord, right? Of course right. Okay? He's the Lord. And Peter picks this up in 1 Peter 1.25, But the word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word which was preached to you. All right, so we need to build on the text of Scripture as it is written, not as interpreted by tradition. And I want to go over tradition. I want, to, I want to expand on this idea of tradition just a little bit with you. And for that, we will review what our good friend Rabbi Miller said. I believe we, I gave you these slides earlier. This is Rabbi Avigdor Miller, ultra-Orthodox rabbi, one of the modern gedolim, one of the modern great ones. In his book, Rejoice, O Youth, he says, the truth of Judaism stands on its traditions. The truth is unknown to those who merely know the scriptures. The only way, way to know the truth of the scriptures is through tradition. Today the only, man, only men who can recognize the truth are those who have it by tradition. The truths of our history and the truths of the universe, the universe, are to be known only from our tradition. Our tradition is the only reliable source of truth today. The most vital part of the Torah is what? The oral tradition. The written tradition in the form of the scriptures is then indeed the document of greatest reliability in the world without anything even slightly resembling them in veracity. He's absolutely right. The Bible is the document with the greatest reliability in the world. Okay, he's exactly right. But what does he say about this document? Let's go on. The written tradition comprises but a minor part of the Torah tradition, of which the greater part is what? The oral tradition, the Mishnah and the Talmud. Now, a young man named David Klinghoffer wrote this book. I have a copy of it, as you can see here. Why the Jews Rejected Jesus. Uh, there he is. There's the author of that book. David Klinghoffer hits the issue right on the nose. Bing. Hmm? He's a Jewish writer. He's, he's well known for this book. Okay. Take my word for it. He wrote the book. Okay. All right. All right, he hits it right on the nose. He hits the, the bullseye smack dab in the center. From page 59 of Why the Jews Rejected Jesus. Jesus did not see himself as a link in the chain of tradition. This was a repudiation of the very heart of rabbinic faith. Bingo. There it is. That's exactly correct. Without tradition, and this is the, and he's not a believer in Jesus, you guys. He's a, he's a, no, he's not a believer in Jesus, okay? Without tradition, here's the problem he sees. Either the cryptic text of the Pentateuch is locked forever, its true meaning indiscernible. So if you just come to the, to the Pentateuch, to the Torah, and read it, you're going to be all confused. You're never going to be able to make heads or tails out of it. It's a closed book. It's a confusing book. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah. I hope not. No. No, <laughs> no way. Okay. So it's a, it's a confusing book. That's, its meaning is indiscernible. 
or it was open to all to guess as their intellect or, womb dire or whim directed them. A free-for-all of scriptural interpretation where the Torah means whatever the reader wants it to mean. And there you go the other way. Well, just make it mean anything. Well, you know, you guys, if you employ the golden rule, that the plain sense of scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Therefore, take every word in its normal, natural, everyday meaning unless the facts of the immediate context studied in the light of axiomatic and fundamental truths indicates otherwise. You apply that to the Torah and you'll have no problem. I shouldn't say that. You know, the Bible is not the easiest book in the world, I agree with you. But you will be able to understand it. It is not an indiscernible book that you just can go willy-nilly with. Okay, So that's why he says we have to have tradition. Tradition has to tell us what it means. We have no other option. However, uh, Jacob Neusner, a well-known rabbi, again not a believer, has written the book Judaism and the Interpretation of Scripture. There's Rabbi Neusner, he's a prolific writer. I think I've got more books by him in my library than I care to count. Here's what he says. Now notice what he says here. On page 205 of Judaism and the Interpretation of Scripture, he says, the tradition progressively diminishes. In other words, it's a declining position. It's degrading. How does it degrade? As the failure of each generation to acquire mastery of the Torah, equivalent to that of its predecessor, exacts a cost through neglect and forgetfulness of the Torah. You know, when you study and learn, you don't pick up everything your teacher had, do you? Okay? The disciples, therefore, have to bear a heavy burden of guilt for neglect of the Torah that they should acquire from their master, just as he bears that same burden of guilt for not learning what he should have learned from his master. Not a pretty position, not a pretty position to be in, huh? You can't come to the text free and clear and learn directly from the text. You're le learning from a a um, degraded teacher according to his position. Now what does Rabbi Miller say about that? Would Rabbi Miller agree with him do you think? How many would bet that Rabbi, Rabbi Miller would agree with him? He would. Would not? He would not agree. How many take that position? How many would say he would agree with Neusner? <laughs> Alright I'll give you the answer. He was ambivalent. Uh, we'll see he's not ambivalent. Okay you ready? That's, that's your, that's, uh, take the middle road there, Roger. Yeah. All right. What would Rabbi Miller say? Okay. Page 188. Listen to one of the words of the chief sages. Rabbi Yochanan said, The fingernail of the ancients is better than the belly of the latter generations in Yoma 9b. The fingernail is not a vital part of the body, whereas the belly contains the vital organs. The point? The worst elements of the populace in the generation of the first destruction were better than the best men of the following generations. He's agreeing 100% with Neusner. On page 235. 235. Okay. I thought his stance was traditional. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. It is. But what is he admitting here? Let's read on. Page 235. Not only did the greatest of the Tanaim proclaim their extreme inferiority to the prophets, but also the Amoraim, the next school, proclaimed their inferiority to the Tanaim. Before the words of Atana, the greatest of Amoraim retreated and yielded. Remember the principle that I taught you? Atana can disagree with Atana, but he can't disagree with the scriptures. And Amora can disagree with an Amora, but he can't disagree with Atana. That's exactly what he's talking about here. Okay? The result. Rabbinic Judaism is a self-admitted decaying system built on sand. Self-admitted decaying system. Okay. You know, they know it. Because they say every generation is inferior to the previous one. Well, where does it stop? when you're at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean like the, like the Titanic is? Is that when it stops? When you're a total wreck at the bottom of the ocean? Yes? I was thinking a picture of this might be Tevia when he was looking at his daughters and how they were each 
one rejecting aspects of tradition. Right, that right. Chose their husband. Yeah, yeah. And everything going downhill in his life, his whole life, till he got to the point where he couldn't take it any longer. You know, when Havilah, yeah. when Havilah married the Gentile, he just broke him. Yeah. This doesn't end until the last Gentile is saved. And yeah, this won't end until the, last, until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. All righty, I've got 745. I've kept you 30 seconds into your break. So go ahead and take your break and listen for the shofar, okay? All right, now let's pick it up on section 72. By the way, I'm sorry I didn't mention this. But most of those quotes that we just went through are on page 7 of Lesson 5. Most of those quotes. You, you, fo you were following along. Great. Okay. Let's turn to page 8 then. Lesson 5, page 8 at the top. Section 72 then is the reaction of the multitudes. And it's a short little paragraph, only two sentences long. Middle of page 71. Everybody there at... <laughs> At, uh, 70, at uh, paragraph 72. All right, verse 28. The result was that when Jesus had finished these words, the multitudes were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. So there's a marked difference between Messiah's teaching and that of the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees always taught from derived authority. They always quoted previous authority. And uh, one of the commentaries I use for this class is a rabbinic commentary in the New Testament by Rabbi Samuel Tobias Locks. If you can find it, I really would recommend you get it. It's out of print right now, so I don't think you're going to find it on um, Amazon. But if you rummage around in some of these out of print book, websites. Uh, it's a very, very uh, good commentary on Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You get a lot of Jewish backgrounds out of it. And uh, here is Rabbi Locks. There is a, um, there's a Facebook page for him as well. That's where I got this picture off of his Facebook page. <laughs> and I believe he's gone many years, but his uh, memory is kept alive. All right, what does Rabbi Locks say? In regard to this comment, he says, the crowds were used to the type of preaching which characterized the scribes Pharisees. Their procedure was to teach the oral law by citing the authorities from whom the speaker received the traditions being transmitted. Failure to do so, note this again, failure to do so was considered not only a display of arrogance, but destructive of the system breaking the continuum of the process. It's exactly what, um, who is our friend here, David, um, the other guy, uh, I just, uh, I just showed. Klinghoffer. Klinghoffer, yes, there we go. <laughs> exactly what David Klinghoffer said using different words, right? Exactly the same thing. Now an example of going to other authorities uh, is in your outline, Maase Berachot 2a, and I want you to notice how the authorities are referred to in this particular argument here. The Mishnah, that's the formal oral law. From what time may one recite the Shema in the evening? The Shema is Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Okay, that's the Shema. From what time may we rec recite the Shema in the evening? And we get some answers here to this question. Because there was a reciting of the morning Shema and the reciting of the evening Shema. From the time that the priests enter their houses in order to eat their truma, that's their offering, until the end of the first watch, about 9 p.m. These are the words of Rabbi Eliezer. So Rabbi Eliezer says you got from the time the rabbis, the uh, priests go into their home till 9 o'clock to say the Shema. Okay, then you're done. Then you can't say it. That's Rabbi Eliezer's opinion. <laughs> the sages say until midnight. So the sages extend that time limit another three hours from 9 o'clock to midnight. Okay, you see that? Okay, so now I can say the Shema till midnight. 
Rabbi Gamaliel says, until the dawn comes up. So he extends it another six hours. So you see all these authorities they're quoting to try and come to a conclusion. And speaking about Rabbi uh, Gamaliel, once it happened that his sons came home late from a wedding feast and they said to him, we have not yet recited the evening Shema. He said to them, if the dawn has not yet come up, you're still bound to recite. So you can still, you still need to say it, kids. And not in respect to this alone did they, did they so decide, but wherever the sages say until midnight. So really, the sages' opinion ruled. Mid midnight was the uh, preferred limit. This, the precept may be performed until the dawn comes up. The precept of burning the fat and the sacrificial pieces too may be performed till the dawn comes up. Similarly, all the offerings that are to be eaten within one day may lawfully be consumed till the coming of the dawn. Well, wait a second. We do things differently on all this other stuff. Why then did the sages say till midnight? Why did they cut it off there? Why didn't they let it go all the way till the dawn? In order to keep a man far from transgression. So you see how the authorities are quoted back and forth. And what is this idea about keeping a man far from tra tra transgression? That's building a fence around the law. If the law allows you to say the precept, perform a precept until dawn, well, let's not risk somebody saying a little late, you know, let's back it off till midnight. Let's say, you got to say it before midnight. And if we really want to be conservative, by 9 o'clock, okay? So that if you break this rabbinic tradition, you're not breaking the law. See the idea there? This is building a fence around the Torah. That's like set your clock 10 minutes early so you won't, won't be late. <laughs> not good idea. Set your clock 10 minutes early so you won't be late. Exactly. So this is the kind of teaching that the, that the um, multitudes were used to. This paragraph here uh, on page 8. That's what they were used to hearing. Rabbi Gamaliel says this. The sages say this. Eliezer says this. You know, back and forth. But in the Sermon on the Mount, Messiah quoted no one except the Mosaic Law itself. That was his only authority. He didn't quote many, many authorities. He taught as one having authority, not as one with delegated authority. And the people see the difference. It's rather obvious, isn't it? When you compare the Mishnah here to the Sermon on the Mount. So the Sermon on the Mount is Yeshua's public rejection of the authority of the Mishnah. Now at the bottom of the page, mark it up moment. I want you to star the sentence at the bottom of page 8. The rejection of the authority of the Mishnah will lead to their rejection of his Messiahship. There's the issue. David Klinghoffer, um, Rabbi Locks, etc. Rejection of the authority of the Mishnah, of the traditions, will lead to their rejection of his Messiahship. All right. Now, I'll come, some comments on tradition. Page 9, top of the page. Tradition and Yeshua. I want to say some words about tradition. Yeshua was not against tradition by itself. He wasn't against tradition per se. We all need a certain amount of tradition in our lives. Personal tradition, how we do things. Your churches have their own traditions. Believe me, they do. You know, okay? We all have our traditions. We have to set our own boundaries. We have to decide how we are going to a walk in relation to scripture. We all have to do that. So he wasn't against tradition by itself. But he was against tradition, number one, made obligatory. As soon as we say our tradition rules, he says, oh no it doesn't. Oh no it doesn't. We cannot make our traditions mandatory. And tradition is okay as long as it is not against the Bible. Okay? It has to be biblically consistent. Our traditions have to be biblically consistent. So tradition is fine. Biblically consistent and voluntary. That's the two key issues. Now, a good example of this is the Passover Seder. You know, we just had Seders recently, just a week or so back. And this is a good example of it because 
90% of the stuff we do at Passover Seders is what? Tradition. Tradition. Okay, and Jesus in the Last Supper went through an Orthodox Passover Seder. 90% of the stuff he did there was tradition. He wasn't against tradition per se, but he followed the Passover traditions voluntarily. Okay, he did not accept the authority of those traditions. So he wasn't against tradition in and of itself. And the same thing is true with our churches and with our own lives. Legalism does not set in unless we tell others you gotta do it my way okay or our way is in violation of the Bible okay that's what we have to keep in mind does that make sense okay we always have to keep that in mind yes Cindy we gotta do it Yahweh yes not my way great okay all right section 73 middle of page 9 a certain centurion's faith and the healing of his servant. Matthew and Luke cover this. Now a centurion. Here's a centurion, you guys. A centurion was a Roman officer in charge of a hundred men. And he looks rather intimidating there, doesn't he? Like a target. He, he, well, yeah. That's the thing. I wondered about that thing in his head. Yeah, the thing in his head, you know. Here I am, shoot me. I wonder if it was a signal to the, to the troops to be able to identify their commander. That's probably what it was. There, there's our commander right over there. But it also made him a target. So he's all dressed up here in his battle array. Now, these guys, these guys were usually not kind to the subjugated people. They usually oppressed the people. And this guy is in charge of Capernaum, the city of Capernaum. Now, this guy is also different. This centurion is different. And the difference is seen in, number one, his concern for slaves. Slaves were normally considered property that you just threw away. Get sick, eh, dump him and get a new one. You know, like, a, like an iPad, <laughs> like a computer. Get rid of it. Get a new one, right? So he's concerned for slaves. And secondly, he has a love for Israel and the Jewish people. He recognizes that as a Gentile, he has no access to the Messiah. And so he sends intermediaries to the Messiah saying that he is not worthy. Let's pick it up then on Luke chapter 7, verse 1. And we're at the bottom of page 71 in your harmony. Section 73, we're in the right-hand column. Verse 1. When he had completed all his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. All right, let's take a look at the map. Here's a Google map eye view of the territory. You can see in the bottom right-hand right corner, that's the Sea of Galilee. And right there is the traditional location for the Sermon on the Mount. That's it right there. And uh, when you go to Israel, and all of you will go to Israel someday, Right? Yeah. Of, course. of course right. You all will go to Israel someday. The bus will take you down this road. You'll go down this road right here. You'll come to this parking lot. You'll get out of your bus. And you'll take this little walkway past the, uh, past the gift shop, which is right there, up to the, that's the, um, the little chapel. That's there, okay? So that's what you'll visit. Now, here is Capernaum. Here is Capernaum. The distance between the two, mile to a mile and a half. So when you go to Israel, your bus will, your bus will come up this road here, and you'll come to the gate right here, and you'll turn right into the driveway to Capernaum. Remember that picture I showed you right there? Standing at the gate, looking to the east, and what did you see in the east? The little chapel. Remember that? See how close it is? Mile to a mile and a half. Very, very close. So if this is the traditional location of the Sermon on the Mount, and it's possible that it is, uh, then Jesus leaves the uh, Mount, he leaves the area, and he just goes over to his headquarters here in Capernaum. Very, very short walk. All right, let's pick it up on Matthew, excuse me, Luke 7, verses 2 through 5. Continuing in the Luke account. Verses 2 through 5. And a certain centurion slave, who was highly regarded by him, 
was sick and about to die. And when he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly entreated him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. So the, the centurion doesn't feel that he's worthy, but the elders of Capernaum evaluate him as worthy, and they give two reasons why he's worthy. He loves our nation. So here's a Gentile with a Jewish heart, even in the first century. And a lot of you guys here have Jewish hearts. You know exactly what he's thinking. And this guy is a Roman. Amazing. And secondly, they say he built our synagogue. Now here's a, an aerial view of Capernaum. And you're looking at the white synagogue. This is the... The White Synagogue is the 4th century Byzantine era synagogue. But synagogues didn't change location from era to era. And this synagogue is built upon the foundation of the 1st century synagogue. So now we're going to move. We're going to, this next shot is going to be in this area right here, looking at the, at the synagogue. And so I'm standing looking at the synagogue there and you can see the black basalt foundation that the uh, white synagogue sit, sits upon. Can you see that okay? Uh, let's get in a little closer. I'm going to move over to the, to the fence there and look through the fence. All right, can you see that foundation even clear? Yeah, it's Hila, right? Yeah, it's Hila. <laughs> she gets in my shows. That's one of our uh, guides. Great lady. We love Hila. And she's pointing to the sign that explains what you're seeing there. The late 4th century A.D. white synagogue built upon the remains of the synagogue of Jesus. So it is those black basalt foundation stones that the, that the centurion paid for. He financed the, that black basalt foundation. Only thing left of it now is the, is the bottom row of stones. There it is. There it is. That's why it's so neat to go to Israel. You see and you stand in the exact location where these things happened. All right. Sen uh, Capernaum is a great place to visit. All righty. Let's take a look at verses 6 through 8. Luke chapter 7, 6 through 8. We're now, of course, on page 72. And we pick it up in the right-hand column, verse 6. Now Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I, too, am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. When I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. All right. This centurion understands authority, doesn't he? First of all, he is under his own commander, so he is under authority, but he's over a hundred men, and so he has authority. So not only were his orders carried out, but he had to execute orders as well. And so he very clearly recognizes the Messiah's ability to give a command in verse 8. So here we have the recognition of the Messiah's authority by a Gentile. By a Gentile. Now let's move on. We go over to the Matthew account now and pick it up on, at verse 10. Matthew gives us some more details about this event. Verses 10 through 13. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. And I say to you, that many shall come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom shall be cast out into the outer darkness in that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, 
Let it be done to you as you've believed. And the servant was healed that very hour. All right, this is a preview of what's going to happen on a national scale. Uh, lesson 5, page 10. Lesson 5, page 10. And if you were following along, you were already there. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mention that. Now that word translated in the NASB, marveled, means to be amazed. Means to be amazed. And this doesn't mean that Jesus was caught by surprise here. But when I read that, I think about when I've talked to atheist friends. You know, I know exactly what they're going to say, I know exactly what they believe, but when they mouth their atheism, I am just amazed. Every time, right? I'm just amazed that they could reject the evidence all around them. And I think that's exactly the way we should take that statement here. That um, this man is responding to the evidence. And that no one else is. A Gentile responding properly to the evidence. Now the, um, the Pharisees taught that the Jewish people were the sons of the kingdom. They taught that all Israel has a share in the world to come. We've covered that earlier. Sanhedrin 10.1. I hope you remember that. You know, um, going to hell, that's a Gentile problem. We Jews don't have to worry about that. Born a Jew, you're in the kingdom. No problem. No problem. But with the Gentiles, it's questionable. But Jesus says something different here. He says that Gentiles, like the centurion, are recon recognizing the authority of the Messiah, and the Jewish people are failing to do this. Failing to do this. But you know, this idea of authority is a very, very Jewish concept. We understand authority too. And an example of our understanding authority is a Berachot 34b, which is at the bottom of your your page. You know, this is a, not something that's restricted to the Roman army. Barakot 34b. If one makes a mistake in his tefillah, in his prayer. By the way, I've been asked to do a, a glossary of unfamiliar terms. And I'm working on that. I hope to have it for you next week. Yay. So, um, I've had to edit, edit it down from eight pages to four, I believe. <laughs> the key terms. But we, say again? <laughs> yeah, but I got to do a hundred copies. <laughs> All righty, and I got to I got to pay for that on the Xerox machine. All right. So tefillah, prayer. If one makes a mistake in his prayer, it is a bad sign for him. And if he is a reader of the congregation, it is a bad sign for those who have commissioned him. Why is it? Because a man's agent is equivalent to himself. See. We, the rabbis understood that someone who is the agent of someone else brings that authority with him. The Roman centurion had behind him all the authority of Rome, didn't he, and the Roman army. And the same thing is true here. A man's agent is equivalent to himself. And what is Jesus? Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the agent of God. And he's authenticated his position as God's representative to man by the miracles he's been doing. And so the conclusion that the Jewish community should reach based on thinking like Barachot 34b is that the Son of God is equivalent to God the Father. And Jesus the Messiah is the God-man who came in fulfillment of the scriptures. But they are not coming to that conclusion. All right, let's go on to page 11. Section 74, the widow's son raised at Nain. So let's begin in uh, Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 15. We start at the bottom of, of uh, the page, section 74. We'll read verses 11 through 15. Everybody there in your harmony? Okay, and it came about soon afterwards that he went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him. Accompanied by a large multitude. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, 
and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her, and he said to her, Do not weep. And he came up, and he touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Can you imagine that scene? I'd, I'd like to see that. I wish I was there. This corpse is laid out. You know, dead as a stone, cold as a stone. And all of a sudden he sits up. Mom! You know, something, something like that. Must have been a great scene. All right. Now, Nain is a town south of Nazareth. And here we have our map. Uh, here is Nazareth uh, overlooking the Jezreel Valley. And then south of Nazareth is Nain, right there, nestled right up against the hill of Moray. And here is a map of that area. Here's Nazareth. And in the next picture, I'm standing at the location of Nazareth, and I'm looking across this arm of the Jezreel Valley at Nain, which is tucked again, tucked into this little crevice of the hill of Moray. And so here's that view. We're looking across that arm of the Jezreel Valley, the hill of Moray's in the background, and there is the little town of Nain today. And if you visit it, if you drive up the road, it's a little tiny Arab village, again, on the slopes of the hill of Moray. So that's the way it looks today. All right, so he's going into the town on that same road, probably, and he meets a funeral procession coming out. And the mom who has just lost her boy is a widow. So she first lost her husband, who was her primary means of support. Now she, and then the son took over. And now she's lost her son. She's lost the only person that could care for her in her old age. She is being reduced to abject poverty. She has a very, very bleak future ahead of her. And so Yeshua exercises compassion. I don't think for one reason only. I think he exercised compassion because here's this mom who's lost her son. And there's a love of, you, uh, of moms for the son. But also the fact that she is facing a life of poverty. So he has compassion on her. And uh, this resurrection or this restoration to life occurs. Now, notice that only six verses cover this incident. This is a very, very brief account of a resurrection. I want you to note that. Just remind, uh, just tuck that away in your hard drive, okay? Just stick it there under, um, under Life of Messiah, you know? Save it there. Now, the um, Hill of Moray is an interesting place where this happened. The word Moray means teacher. So the point here is that the teacher taught a great lesson at Teacher Hill. And that lesson is in verses 16 and 17. Verses 16 and 17. And there are three results from the teacher's teaching at Teacher Hill. The first result is verse 16, the first part of the, of the verse. Fear gripped them all, and they began glorifying God. So the fear of God, the glorifying of God is the first result. Next part of the verse, saying, a great prophet has arisen among us and God has visited his people. So here we see a recognition of the Messiah's prophetic office. Not that he's the Messiah. Recognition of his messianic office is not recognized yet. Only, if, only the disciples are beginning to understand who Jesus is. They're only starting to learn. So they see him as a prophet, but that's all. And verse 17. And this report concerning him went out all over Judea and in all the surrounding district. So you'd expect his fame to spread further in Galilee, in that area. But here we're told that, it, that the account of this miracle is even talked about in Judea, three days to the south. Three days to the south. The Judeans get this message. Why? Well, first of all, it's a miracle, a resurrection. But secondly, the controversy that it would generate. We're now at normal occurrence. Bottom of page 11. Bottom of page 11. You see, normally, touching a beer or touching a coffin 
rendered the person unclean. Here's a guy claiming to be the Messiah and claiming to be a prophet, and he is touching some a dead body. But how do you handle that when the person becomes alive? Okay, how do you handle that? Instead of him turning unclean, suddenly this guy is resurrected back to life, to physical life. Yes. I understand that's that's Judaic principle and teaching, but was that also among the Romans too? Among the Romans? Uh, no, they didn't have cleanliness or uh, rules like the Jewish community did. So it's no. Basically a Jewish yeah, this is a Jewish thing. Yeah, yeah, it's found in the Torah and then ex uh, expanded in the oral law. So this guy starts out dead and he ends up alive. Can you imagine the pill-pull reasoning that this would generate? What's pill-pull reasoning? You'll get it in your, uh, in your um, glossary. But pill-pull reasoning is quibbling over insignificant details. That's what it is. Taking something apart and just tearing into every minute detail. Can you imagine the type of quibbling that this incident would generate? He touched, he's unclean, but he raised him from the dead. But he's unclean, but he raised him from the dead, you know. When I see this uh, section of scripture, I think it might be an example of Yeshua's sense of humor. <laughs> I think he probably walked away from this incident smiling because the mama was so happy, but thinking into himself, I wonder what the rabbis are going to be doing with this. <laughs> well, knowing. All right. All right, that's enough for today. I got 8.30 and 58 seconds. I've kept you a minute late. So let me go ahead and pray. And uh, we'll turn you loose. We'll take a look at section 75 next week. John the Baptist's relationship to the kingdom. So let me pray. Father, again, I want to thank you for your word. Thank you for the great choice that lays in front of everybody, not only us, but everybody. Do we align ourselves with mankind's traditions, or do we align ourselves with the text, the text of Scripture that lives and abides forever? Help us, Lord, to <clears throat> always stick by your text and never deviate from it, a text that has survived from when it was first given till today, 4,000 years of adversity. Your word lives and abide forever. And Lord, it has power. And help us always to um, take your word for what it says. For example, I'm not ashamed of the, of, the, um, of the gospel. For it is the power of God to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Lord, help us to keep that procedure in mind and take this message to a community, to, uh, to our friends and neighbors and relatives who still say that Jesus is not for the Jew, still reject him, and still adhere to tradition. Help us to do that. Give us opportunity in Yeshua's name. Amen. Alrighty, we'll see you next week.